get started here, this is going to be recorded and um, we will post it to our website at a later time. So if you have to leave early, um, please keep yourself muted. If you would like to ask questions of Zoe, um, please put them in the chat and Katrina will um, ask them throughout the conversation. Um, so enjoy. I'd like to welcome um, Katrina Daniels, our Exhibitions and Retail Gallery Director, and she will lead the conversation today with Zoe. Um, so enjoy. Welcome everyone. Thank you for taking the time to um, take a little time out of your day to join us for one of our monthly artist talks. Um, thank you, Michelle, for introducing me. I am Katrina, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I work with our artists in a variety of capacities here, including our exhibitions, public art, and retail gallery. Um, Zoe, could you please introduce yourself to our, our audience? Uh, sure, thank you, Katrina. Uh, my name is Zoe Beaudry. I'm an oil painter currently living and working in Detroit, Michigan. And I'm originally from East Lansing, Michigan and grew up going to the Lansing Art Gallery, showed my first uh, piece in a gallery when I was in high school with the Art Scholarship Alert, and then um, volunteered there later. So it's a place that uh, kind of feels like home to me. So I'm really happy to be here. Oh, I love that. Um, and we have an, um, an upcoming show of yours in 2023. Yeah, just about a year away. So, sorry, I don't have a name for it yet. But <laughs> that's all right. No, no that's all right. Too. On that one. <laughs> it's, no, no problem. Um, just something for people to kind of put on their um, their calendar and, and just be aware of that there's more to look forward to. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I'll be monitoring that. Happy to um, direct those to Zoe. And of course, we'll also have time at the end. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about um, when you first became interested in the arts? Yeah, I think um, I was lucky enough to grow up in a place and in a family where uh, it was, the arts were celebrated and I was always drawing and painting as a kid and that was, uh, something that was welcomed and encouraged from a young age. Um, did art through high school and my former teacher, Robin Reamer Science is here. I'm Mrs. Reamer Science. <laughs> and um, that was all really wonderful. I don't think it was until I was in college that I had a bit of a mindset shift about artwork and what it can do. I took a few courses around that time in oil painting, learned about that medium, took a course in contemporary art where I learned that, you know, contemporary art or fine art isn't just about decoration or beauty, but can be about any possible combination of ideas that you want it to be about. And I had also always viewed it as something that you had to have like a very specialized knowledge in order to be able to understand or I thought of contemporary art as something that was like you needed a secret code to be able to understand what the easily summarizable meaning was uh, and when I was in college I basically learned that actually uh, viewing art or learning about art is something that you can use your own intuition or just the knowledge that you showed up with to develop your your response to it and once I started to think of it as something that was more accessible uh, that made me view it as something that was more legitimately impactful in the world and uh, after that I started to think maybe this is something that I could develop or pursue uh, professionally so I think it was twofold it was like something that felt really good my whole life and then once I was a little bit older understanding that uh, art could be lots of things. It could be philosophy or science or history or uh, activism, so yeah. Did you, um, was that through an art history course that you learned that or was that through your fine arts work? 
Um, I think it was a little bit of both, but mostly the art history course. It was a contemporary art since 1980 course, uh, which compared to the other art history courses, it just felt more relevant, you know, and, and spoke mm -hmm. to me on, in a different, more everyday level. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience. I, um, I remember actually uh, studying art history also kind of around the 80s and the particular um, professor that I took the class with, um, you know, also looked through the lens of, you know, activism looking at, um, you know, the AIDS quilt and um, whole movements, you know, that were, that were very political and that was really awe-inspiring for me, very different than looking at like one piece of portraiture. Right. Um, you know, in a um, um, often in like maybe a religious setting or something like that. So I had kind of a similar uh, experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, could you give our audience um, a little bit of an overview of um, what inspires your work? And I know this is kind of a broad question um, and, it, and you're welcome to, you know, to share any examples that might feel relevant. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think that my there's a lot of ideas and layers of uh, cultural references and um, you know more brain centric things that get layered on top of my work, but ultimately at its core, it's always inspired by my feelings. Um, it's always inspired by some sort of deep, well, maybe it's not always deep, <laughs> but it's always inspired by something that, that I feel in a genuine and sincere way. And a lot of the, the feelings that have been the most persistent or felt the most deep to me have been around aspects of the human experience that are universal, like human suffering or joy or well-being and the different ways that that can can look um, and then just a healthy dose of existential angst on top of that and so those, those sort of like bigger um, aspects of the human experience or really old not very trendy questions like what does it mean to exist why am i here is my experience real and uh and I think that the big one for me is always uh, is my experience as an individual being an illusion and we're all part of the same thing or am I actually some sort of individual soul that's existing in the universe. Um, so those are the questions and then to answer those questions again and again I always return to the, the body as like the container for the individual self or the individual experience of the world. And I've always been really interested in the places where the body itself becomes an imperfect container uh, for, for the self. So places or moments like um, conception and birth or um, injury or surgery or eating. I mean, yeah, just, just moments where uh, the individual is no longer like this singular thing, but is actually merging with the world around them in, in some way are places that I'm really fascinated with. So I think there's always been a thread of that going mm -hmm. through the work. Um, sure. And then on top of those sort of deeper questions and deeper feelings, there's always like a, um, a bit of however I'm, I'm, I'm feeling that day that's in there as well. You know, the, um, the sadness or the happiness or the, the more regular fluctuations somehow get in the work too. Um, I was t reading your your website um, and just kind of reviewing some of your work. Um, you talked about, uh, I don't know if you, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that you studied or maybe identify as a Buddhist or Buddhism is, a, is, is part of your practice, is that correct? Definitely, I, um, I'm not, sure if I would say that I identify that way, but it's certainly a uh, tradition that I've been interested in for, um, you know, years, I guess, uh, a number of maybe 10 years or so. Uh, and the practices associated with different Buddhist traditions are um, valuable to me. And uh, 
some of the imagery uh, that has come out of traditions like that is also uh, found itself into my work a little bit. Um, I think that Buddhism is, is a way of at least coping with those big questions that I was talking about, mm -hmm. <laughs> and ideas, um, not necessarily providing any uh, answers or like real, you know, um, hard answers, but uh, there is a lot of comfort to be found, I think, in some of the, in that ideology of noticing and awareness and uh, being present and things like that. So that's, that's certainly something that I, that I hope is communicated somewhat through, through the paintings. Um, I also brought that up too, because you, um, when you spoke about this idea of the human body as being sort of an imperfect vessel, um, you know, Please forgive me if anyway, I, I haven't studied Buddhism extensively, but um, from my, my little knowledge of it, um, I uh, think there's this idea of maybe the body as being a temporary vessel um, for um, where there's opportunities in Buddhism to, um, I don't know if soul is the correct word, but um, to be able to kind of um, transcend um that like current time and space is that something that you are thinking about or, or have thought about in your work um looks like so we might be might have lost her for a moment um why don't we as we give um, Zoe a minute to, um, to come back to us, the, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and share um, some images of Zoe's work, just to kind of, in case anyone is not familiar with her work or to give a little bit more context of when Zoe was talking about the use of the human body, um, how prominently, you know, figurative work is, you know, included in her body of work. I think that, um, and if you haven't seen her work in person, as Zoe mentioned, she works in oil and it is just so beautifully layered and, um, her figures, the skin almost feels uh, translucent at times. It's really, really beautiful. And this is an image that shows a, a, a close up of, of uh, one of her, her portraits. And also some of the, you know, imagery that I think she is, um, you know, maybe has found in some of her travels abroad. I'm hoping to speak with Zoe about that as well when, um, when she comes back. Just maybe momentarily. Um, and just again, as like, as uh, Zoe was kind of talking about some of the, you know, these ideas of, you know, the human body, birth, um, surgeries, all of these other, you know, areas where, you know, she is kind of exploring some of these, um, these bigger questions. You can see that in some of her work. Hi, can you guys hear me again? Yes, yay. I was just um, sharing out and I had to restart my modem. No problem. I was just sharing some of your work to kind of give um, our audience a little bit of context about, um, yeah. you're welcome, but <laughs> welcome back. So right, right before um, we lost you, I was asking um, about, um, so in the study of Buddhism, um, and as I, I mentioned, I'm, I'm by no means a scholar, but my limited knowledge um, is that there is idea where the human, your, especially your current form is a temporary vessel for the soul or the mind. Um, 
and you had talked a little bit about sort of the human body as being like this imperfect vessel. Um, do any of those ideas uh, play into your work? Certainly, I think that um, the whole, uh, the process of being born, living life and dying is one that can be viewed as, um, you know, circular in a way or cyclical. Um, and by attempting to represent people of different uh, ages, I think I'm speaking to those themes a little bit, but, but more so in the, um, some of the imagery that I use has to do with the, the wheel of life, which is a uh, image in Buddhist iconography or the wheel of samsara, the wheel of suffering. It's kind of funny that suffering and life are uh, kind of used interchangeably to describe, <laughs> to describe that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's imagery that's been in there a few times. Uh, I'm not sure that I hold any necessarily beliefs myself about reincarnation, but I think that there is there are basic scientific truths that hold up, you know, about the parts of our bodies becoming parts of everything else and matter and it neither being created nor destroyed. So uh, I think there's there's truth in that that can't that can't be disputed. And that if you look at it on more of a conceptual level, uh, it's true and can be it can be comforting or very disturbing, depending on what perspective you're coming from. Um, so when I was just sharing a bit of your your website, um, I just wanted to see if, sorry, I should have had this up, um, if there was an image of that that we could. Oh, of the wheel itself? Yes. Um, there is, right on the homepage, actually, there's a big uh, picture of this mandala painting. Uh, and that was a pretty, uh, for me, anyway, it was a pretty overt reference to the, the wheel. Okay. Point. This one? That one, yeah. Um, so the, the, traditionally, the, the wheel of life has seven stages of suffering. Mm -hmm. And uh, I changed up the format normally. Normally, it's more like a little, a pie graph, sort of. And then it has this monster holding it around the edges like that. Um, but in this version, I've, I've put three on the outside and then three in, inside the wheel. And uh, of course, the monster back there is me. <laughs> so um, the, uh, the outer layers are meant to represent maybe more the expansive parts of the human experience, the parts that go out beyond the body. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're interested at all in chakras and um, mm -hmm. energy centers in the body, that might be the top three. Uh, chakras and then the the inner parts of the circle are the parts that are more grounding and, and about uh, being you know present in the world and present in your body so. um, and then this little piece right here this looks like when my um i'm waiting for safari to load is there um is this like a reference to a digital um like something digitally Definitely, yeah. Um, that, it was a bit of just a joke to put it in there. I think it was the last thing that I put on that painting. Uh, and that, that painting was really fun to do because most of the time I plan out uh, compositions very uh, meticulously ahead of time mm -hmm. and know exactly where everything is gonna go and have a pretty good idea of what it's gonna look like. But with this, uh, with this, these mandala paintings, there's no, there's one other one uh, that's done in a similar format. Uh, I didn't really know what where I was going to go with the idea, and that allowed some room for discovery in the process and creating harmonies and disharmonies within the painting that I wasn't really aware were going to exist until they did. And the the spinning wheel of death there in the middle is. <laughs> of that and I think uh, part of it was just kind of a joke you know because people do call that the beach ball of death or the spinning wheel of death and mm -hmm. I like the idea that I was putting that in the center of the wheel of life um, and kind of completing the, the sort of evil eye look there. I love that. Thank you. Let me go back to my questions here. 
um, we talked talked about this um, a little bit, but just to kind of to pull um, back a bit, Zoe, um, could you talk about what uh, medium that you prefer to work in and maybe um, why you're drawn to that particular medium? Yeah, um, I so I primarily work in oil paint. Um, that's a medium that I love just for the materiality of it, the thickness and the, the juiciness and the vibrance of the colors, uh, which certainly you can get vibrance with acrylic paint, but I, for some reason I'm really drawn to the, the types of hues uh, achievable with oil paint. Um, and then sometimes I've experimented with adding other elements to oil paintings, but oil is my, uh, my one true love. Um, but it's also a medium that is deeply imbued with history and uh, some of which is, can be disturbing, you know, uh, down to like very problematic. <laughs> Sometimes uh, it's, it's, a, it's a medium that's historically excluded most, most people from being able to practice it and uh, especially women and people of color. And uh, it's even today, it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's an expensive practice, you know, it's something that uh, it's an investment. And I think it's important to recognize that. But um, also, I think that all of that history or feeling like I'm on the, the current wave of that history is part of what makes me feel excited and passionate about it too, or viewing my work, but also the work of people around me as this sea change in the, the fine art or contemporary art painting world in terms of like who is seen as being worth uh, celebrating or what stories or what ideas are worth uh, bringing to light and representing and platforming. Uh, so yeah, I would say it's a, it's, a, it's a long history obviously of oil paint, but it's, it's something that I love and I'm, I'm really happy to be a part of. Um, I had, so I was under, I, I, I'm aware of the fact that oil painting is expensive and therefore kind of exclusionary, but I don't know as much about the history of it being exclusionary. Is, is that something you'd feel comfortable sharing a little bit about to give um, our audience a little bit of context? Well, I think that oil painting is something that for a long time was just relegated to, it was a practice mostly. I mean, of course there were, you know, always exceptions, but it was for and by men. And that's why there are so many paintings of nude women. And I love, I paint nude women all the time, <laughs> but um, you know, the, the traditional, male thinker, genius painter, and then passive, uh, usually feminine uh, subject is a, a dichotomy that uh, is like deeply embedded in the history of oil paint, I think. And also, you know, for years, painters didn't have the opportunities to make anything unless it was deemed worthy of being made, you know? So um, a lot of the imagery what had to do with um, mythology and religious stories and, and uh, royalty and important people, wealthy people, right? So uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't until uh, the 20th century that many other voices began to get a little bit louder. And it wasn't until the, the end of the 20th century that really uh, you started to hear like a, like a, a rumbling from, from everyone, <laughs> you know? Um, and now I feel like there's uh, just the start of this cacophony of voices in the, in the painting world that's really exciting and diverse and, and new, so. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think about too, uh, to your point about why work was, was created and also if we think about, I mean, a lot of work was commissioned, you know? And so then if you think about who had the money and why certain pieces are being commissioned, um, it certainly kept the work in this sort of tunnel, you know, um, of if, if only um, a small class of people want to have their own portrait painted <laughs> and um, have that hung, you know, somewhere, it, it keeps um, 
body of work rather limited. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then I just wanted to, I just have a couple questions from the audience for you. So I want to take the time to share those. Um, the first one is your use of symbolism is great. Um, are all of your self portraits based on a personal message or story? Um, I think it depends on when it was made. I think and it's on a certain level, yes, but there's not usually a singular message that I'm trying to impart, but some of my first work, um, when I started taking painting a little bit more seriously, maybe like 10, 11 years ago, uh, it was a lot of self-portraits and they were really about self-investigation and trying to understand myself. Mm -hmm. Then over time, even though there were still self-portraits or uh, paintings that had my hand holding something, I've made a million of those, uh, they were, they became more about trying to understand or investigate the world around me. Um, and, and still today there's, there's self-portraits or there's portraits of other people, but I feel like I'm making them with a, a different intention that's more about communicating uh, rather than uh, trying to understand, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and then the other question is, your complimentary hues uh, in your highlights and shadows add such depth to your work. Um, I feel this is one of your strengths. Is this something you intentionally plan or is it more intuitive? That is the intuitive part, actually. It's sometimes um, I usually take photos of subjects or mm -hmm. uh, have people send me photos if they have some sort of experience with art modeling or photography. And um, I'll often have people surrounded by something colorful, basically, just so that the, the colorful light is reflecting on them mm -hmm. and that will find its way into the painting. But uh, or, you know, I'll have the image that I'm looking at on Photoshop and I'll really bump up the contrast or something because I do, I do like to, um, I like to paint people in really vibrant colors, but I think that the, the color and the contrast in the, the flesh itself is the one part of the photorealistic painting that for me feels more intuitive and, uh, like a, it's a surprise to me too, to step back from it and, say like, wow, that really does look like a hand. You know, I thought it was a bunch of colors. And <laughs> that was, that was yeah, and for people who haven't seen um, Zoe's work, it is, uh, photorealism I think is a great, is, is a great phrase to use. Um, it almost, there's so much depth. It does feel as if, um, like I can see the body under the skin, you know, it's just really so, so beautiful. Thank you so much. It's good to You're welcome. Um, we have another question from the audience. Can you share more about the focus of your upcoming spring exhibit and how um, has that evolved in the process of creating work? Absolutely. Um, so I am going to be showing a body of work with Playground Detroit, which I think it was is it uh, Paulina who asked me that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, hi. <laughs> uh, Playground Detroit is a gallery and creative talent agency here in Detroit. And anyone listening should definitely look them up. They have an emerging artist fellowship that sponsors uh, 10 emerging artists in the Detroit area. And uh, I'm lucky enough to be a part of that group of artists this year. Uh, so my show is going to be taking place next March, and I'm currently working on a body of work for that show. Um, and this work is, it's figurative oil paintings. So uh, each painting so far in the series has like one, features one person. And then the new aspect to this work is that I'm actually cutting a small hole in the canvas uh, it's a bit convoluted, but I'm, I'm gluing the canvas to a board and then I'm cutting a hole and then I'm putting a little bit of plexiglass in the hole, mm -hmm. shining light through it. So each painting will have a little bit of light emerging from a certain part of the body. And I actually, I got so distracted talking about what it was, I kind of forgot what the question was. 
Oh, <clears throat> sorry, let me repeat. Um, can you share more about the focus of your upcoming spring exhibit and how has that evolved in the process of creating work? Um, I think that it has a, that uh, idea and that series of paintings has been evolving for a few years now because wanting to make oil paintings where light is shooting out of them is a cool idea, but it was actually very difficult to figure out a way to make that work. Mm -hmm. um, so it took me, I think maybe about a year to, to develop this technique with the plexiglass and the light behind the canvas and everything. And then the past year since then has been um, really my first time creating a body of work that's intended to be all in the same space and harmonizing with itself and speaking to itself. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a work on progress. I was just working on it this morning <laughs> uh, and kind of envisioning um, how I can make all these different people and all these different parts of their bodies that will be shining work with each other. Um, it's something that's, it's something that's ongoing, definitely. I love hearing about that. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that show. That sounds in, incredible. Um, it's also really interesting to think about um, that, yeah, as you're talking about as a group, as, as thinking about how immersive that's gonna feel in that space and um, how the viewer is gonna be reacting to those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it'll be interesting having these lights in, in different areas of the painting because I'm imagining them kind of actually physically shining on to the viewers and wondering, you know, where, where will they be hitting people, you know, above eye level, below eye level, right there. Um, before, I think before working on this series, it's always been, uh, I never knew where my paintings were going to go. <laughs> So the, the idea of painting something in my studio and, and thinking like, oh, I hope this gets to go on a wall someday versus uh, painting, making this whole series and thinking these will be interacting with each other uh, kind of brings a different mindset to, to working. And is this gonna be a solo exhibit? Yes, yep. Oh, fantastic. Um, we do have a, another question from the audience. Um, is there a particular artist or artists that inspire you? Um, there are so many. Uh, one artist that I've been following pretty closely for the past few years is uh, Doriel Kami. Um, she's a figurative painter um, who adds surreal, often arguably silly elements to her painting that are all in sort of a sometimes hyper-realistic, but sometimes slightly more expressive style, a lot of bright colors. And uh, her work is often very allegorical and uh, personal at the same time. And uh, yeah, so she's someone who it said, uh, I'll put the name in the chat if I can find the chat. <laughs> And uh, you guys can uh, Google her. She's wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was I was um, hoping <laughs> hoping you would. Um, let me go back to my questions here. Oh, I also wanted to to touch base um, to Zoe that um, I know travel is something that has been important to you. Um, I, I was reviewing your uh, website. I saw that you did a residency in India, um, and I know you've also um, studied in the UK. Um, can you speak to how, how travel um, and um, just how, how if has um, influenced your work? Yeah, I think that it's influenced, uh, travel has influenced my work a lot. Um, particularly going places where I had the chance to observe uh, religious traditions or, or even just cultural traditions that are very different from the ones that I'm familiar with um, because I'm, I'm really interested in divinity or what, what different people hold to be uh, divine or something that's worth worshiping. Um, 
And so spending time in um, places where the types of places that people make pilgrimages to <laughs> have been very impactful. I, when I was right after I did the residency in uh, Varanasi, India, which is a holy city uh, for Hindus, I actually got the chance to travel to um, Bodh Gaya, which is uh, allegedly the site of the where the Buddha got to sit under the tree. So there's a there's a tree there now, which is very old, but it's only you know only like 200 year 250 years old or something like that. Um, and that was fascinating because it attracts pilgrims, uh, Buddhist pilgrims from from India, but from all over the world. And uh, yeah, getting to go there and experience the 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 clash of um, all the people who have kind of popped up around that area to uh, make money or to live or to um, you know just observe, and then the all the folks that are traveling through uh, those kinds of experiences definitely inform the work because they inform how I view the. The religious or spiritual practice itself. Uh, yeah. That sounds um, fascinating. I spent some time in India and um, I was really interested in seeing how in public spaces and even in rickshaws uh, or little um, sort of small little stores, how religion and religious iconography is just deeply rooted into the everyday mm -hmm. in a way um, that feels in, in my like lived experience feels very different. Um, you know, I remember being in a rickshaw and seeing, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, important religious figures for whomever, you know, was driving the rickshaw, you know, on the, um, just on the dashboard. And, um, you know, it's just, um, it just felt to me like it was part of the just sort of everyday experience, which it just felt um, feels a bit more sterile, sort of more secular to me here you know, in the United States. And um, so it was a really interesting experience to have, um, to have that just be um, just sort of, sort of immersed in it. Definitely. And a lot of the imagery and iconography that you would see in India is a great example, but I think there are other places in the world like this too it's often really um, visceral and passionate and often, often violent, you know, or just, um, I guess visceral is the best word to describe it, but uh, it, it's very different from, you know, just like a cross <laughs> that we might see out in public here. Um, and uh, definitely visually inspiring uh, because of that. Yeah, it is also just so vibrant, just, visually vibrant to my experience being in the um, in Southeast Asia as well, again, comparatively in a different kind of way. Um, you know, I mean, someplace like New York is very visually vibrant, um, but it's like ads of Apple and, you know, like a, it's um, uh, sort of very like corporate in a different way, you know. Which is, you know, I think its own form of God and worship uh, all by itself. Sure, absolutely. Um, let me go back to my questions here. Um, I know we have a little bit more time, so if anybody wants to, you know, ask you more questions again, please feel free to add them to the chat. Um, so we, can you, you touched on this a little bit, um, but can you talk about for your artistic practice, um, are you generally somebody who has like a more free-flowing process or um, is, it, is it more structured, like you work in the studio you know, sort of these days and these times? Um, you know, I, I have always wished it was more free flowing. I uh, admire and envy a little bit artists who have a more free flowing uh, practice, but I think uh, part of it has to do with the inflexibility of the way that I paint, the slow, precise, meticulous way that I paint it doesn't allow for a lot of like, um, you know, just bold, uh, spontaneous moves uh, or spontaneous painting sessions, really. Uh, so I am very, I tend to be very focused and 
planned out with what I'm doing. And, uh, but it's all relative. You know, if I get to paint something or fill in an area that's slightly larger and do a motion like this with my arm, I feel like, wow, <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> um, but uh, doing things like that big mandala that we looked at earlier allow for a little bit more, um, a little bit more surprise and uh, investigation in the process rather than uh, the, the figurative work uh, that I'm doing now where all the surprise is in the, the color itself and the flesh tones and how those emerge as I'm painting them. But the composition itself is, is pretty planned out. So let's say 90% plan, planner. <laughs> You know, one thing I do find um, uh, about having times where it, this sort of like intentional space where you're going to create is for me anyways, sometimes it, um, it's helped create sort of rituals for me where mm -hmm. that helps me to get into that mindset because I know that this is going to be, this is my time to do it. Um, do you ha have anything like that? Um, I, somebody I spoke with said that, you know, they have like, they do yoga and then they go to their studio, you know, like, so it just becomes part of like, like their body knows mm -hmm. when, you know, when it's time. Um, do you have any sort of ritual like that? Um, yes, I think I prefer to paint first thing in the morning. Um, I think my brain is just freshest and the most focused then, but in terms of ritual, um, because it's the morning, that is when I, I do a little bit of yoga, I meditate, I make coffee, usually do some dishes, and even that feels really, <laughs> feels uh, like a really nice cleansing, you know, uh, morning routine, and coming into that, coming into sitting down to work with that, this is a new day, this is a new start feeling, uh, I find very helpful, and also what you said um, about setting aside the time uh, is very helpful as well. Um, and looking at it, it's almost like you're clocking in, uh, you know, but hopefully not as, that sounds a little bit dread inducing, not quite like that, but you know, looking at it like this is my start time and uh, no matter what, I'm gonna try to work this much. That's very helpful uh, for me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I find that there's cert like certain types of music that if I listen to, it's just sort of, um, I have this sort of muscle memory now where if I hear that music that it's just starts to like, you know, I find, um, I just get into the space that I need to be in. So I think it's <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna, just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, and you've talked about this a little bit, um, kind of with your, your upcoming exhibit at Playground Detroit, but, um, can you talk about how your practice has changed over time? Changed over time. Um, yes. Yeah, I, th I think I did um, mention what I think is the main way of going from investigating myself to investigating the world and now being more about communicating. And, you know, I think it might sound a little like, lofty, <laughs> but the, the intention behind the work that I'm making now, it feels much, I feel much more settled in it because it really does feel more like a form of, um, a form of prayer or a form of meditation and a way of, of uh, communicating with, with life itself, you know? Um, and even though there, there's probably visual similarities between what I'm doing now and what I started doing uh I almost I, it really it feels like I'm doing a, a completely different thing even though I'm using some of the same tools like figurative painting oil oil you know and um bright color contrasts um but I do think that uh materially the work itself is probably just getting weirder and going to continue to get weirder uh, now that I'm adding these lights I've gotten really interested in finding out different ways to, to use light and work either inside the work or um, interacting with it somehow. So that's something that's that I'm thinking about uh, for the future 
continuing to get weirder and using using more light. <laughs> I mean, I'm all for it. I'm looking forward to seeing more weird art in the world. Um, we have another question from the audience. Uh, how did you select the people for your current portraits or for your um, upcoming show? Um, I put out a call on Instagram, which I've done that before and I had maybe four or five people get back to me, but this time it was like a whole flood of folks uh, who were interested. And so far it's, I've been working with about half art models and half people that I know and love. So um, I'm hoping that the, the, the love for the people that I, I know that I'm painting will kind of balance out with the professional experience of the, the art models and they'll both have some sort of uh, visual harmony. Um, but it, it, I think it just kind of depends. And because, because this next series that I'm working on um, has to do with these uh, chakras or seven energy centers, uh, I'm choosing the subjects for those paintings based on, based on the, the energy centers themselves. So um, someone, someone who I know some information about, it might be easier for me to know which energy center I want to show some care to in their painting. Someone that I don't know, um, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different thing that I'm, that I'm doing there. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so choosing, choosing is really just like, who seems enthusiastic and about it, and who uh, who's got a um, who looks like you know someone that I that I want to be looking at for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> so I love that. All right. Um, so as we wrap up, uh, can you let everyone know you know what's the best way to find out more of your work and um, keep up with your current and future projects? Yes, um, I think my um, website is one way, uh, which I think that is already in the chat, maybe, maybe not. It's just my name.com. So I'll put that in there. And then um, also the best way is through my Instagram. Uh, so I up try to update that with um, when I'm showing and with some works in progress and uh, other fun life moments. So those are probably the best two. I'll post them both in, both in here. Thank and, you. Um, I just see this other question, the date for the opening of the spring mm -hmm. show. I'm actually not sure yet. I think it'll probably be probably a Friday in late February or early March, but um, I can I can try and find out and get back to you. All right, and so then that'll probably be on your your Instagram and everything as well. Okay, perfect. Exactly. And um and and again, just to um, so we have obviously Zoe's work is coming up at Playground Detroit. Definitely put that on your calendar um, to check out, and um and then we will also have the honor of showing um, Zoe later in 2023. So we have lots of opportunity to see your work, which we're so excited about. Um, thank you again so much, Zoe, for um, taking the time out of your day and, um, and sharing so much about your background and your work with us. Thank and you so much, really. Thank you for such thoughtful questions. And uh, it's really nice to get the chance to, to talk about it. So I really appreciate it. And looking forward to, uh, to working with you guys next year. Oh my gosh, uh, us as well. Thank you. And um, thank you everyone who took the time to come and uh, spend your lunch hour with us and learn more about, about this work. I hope you feel inspired and um, uh, you know, stay tuned on our social media as well. We'll be posting more information about upcoming shows as well as future artist talks. So thank you all again. And um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.